Nope, we don't need to speed up the process. We don't need to nuke this. You know why? Because this is the non-microwave truth. I am C.L. Whiteside, the little man that could, the little man that would. And this is brought to you by Time of Grace Ministry. What are you doing right now? I know that some of you are on a walk or on a run. You're getting in a good workout. Dominate that workout. Dominate that walk. I know that some of you are doing some household chores. Maybe you're cleaning the, the, cleaning the yard, getting that ready. Some of you might be on your way to work or on your way to school. You're making your next move in the car. Well, regardless what you are doing, thank you. Thank you for being here because you got a lot of different things that you could be doing with your time. And time is so precious. But you are here today joining us on the non-microwave truth. I don't take that for granted. So I just want to say thank you. And special thanks to those who have written reviews, hit the five star, shared the podcast with a family member or friend. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Keep, keep it coming. Keep it coming. It's a great way for people to hear about the podcast and hear about God's word from a different perspective, a different life, because we definitely are going to challenge culture's truth and culture's perspective. Now, let's get into our first world problem question today. And that question is this. What sin, what evil thing do you think that most people wish they could get away with? What sin do you think most people wish they could get away with? I thought about like greed and, and envy and even things like stealing. And I'm like, when people commit those sins, they usually do think they are getting away with it and there aren't any consequences. But some sins that jumped out to me that I think people wish they could get away with would be sins of like sexual sins or sins of like inflicting harm on somebody. Somebody did something crazy to you, you can inflict harm on them and there will be no repercussions or nobody will find out about it. Or even taking it to another level, murder. I think some people would murder if they could get away with it and they felt like nobody would find out about it. But I want to hear from you. Instagram, X, TikTok, send me a message. L let me know what you think. What is the sin that you think most people wish they could get away with? Like, ooh, I don't want nobody to know about this, but I would do it if I could. I want to hear from you. My handle is Champion Life 23 and this is our first world problem. It is dinner time. The title of our episode is How to Get Away with Murder. We are in that series talking about going from nothing to something. And this ties in, in so well because when you go from nothing to something and you feel like you have earned something from an earthly standpoint because you have been working and you've been working and you've been working, there can come a point in time where you feel like you are something and you are above the law. Or you can just get whatever you want because you didn't work so hard. So you you can do whatever you want to do. And the episode is titled How to Get Away with Murder. But I want you to think about, is there a sin you wish you could get away with? Is there a sin? Is there some evil that you kind of like, man, if, if nobody knew about it, I would actually do fill in the blank. I want you to think about it. Now, preparing for this episode, I was able to get into scripture and the beauty of getting in scripture. This is something I probably didn't read like 20 plus times. I don't know if I read it in this order, in, in this sequence, reading first Samuel and now second Samuel. I didn't read this so many times, but this is probably the first time ever that I felt sorry or empathized with, with King David and with his um, affair with Bathsheba. And I didn't empathize that he had an affair, but I empathize with the fact that he didn't go to war. He didn't go to war. And it starts off something like, you know, this is the time where kings go to war. And I empathize with King David because when I looked at his life, it's like, dude really didn't get a, get a break. Um, so why I emphasize with him is like, you you have to imagine it. I put myself in, in King David's shoes. Imagine that you were working for 15 years, 15 years to get a position that you were promised. And you it took that long. Like, that's a long time. And in King David's case, it took over a decade for him to become king. So that was one of the big reasons why I empathize. And then I thought about another thing. Imagine somebody trying to put harm on you, put harm on your life. Imagine someone trying to kill you. This was Saul. Saul tried to kill David a number of times. And the fact that this person is trying to kill you and inflict harm on you, you have to run and you have to change your whole entire life and you don't deserve it. And in fact, you could have killed this person, but you spared their life. 
So I just thought that was just like, man, okay, King David's working really, really hard. The fact that he spared somebody's life and he got somebody trying to kill him. And then I thought about King David. It was battle after battle. It talks about war after war he was successful in. Um, and you might not have a, 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 a literal war, but you could have war with, it could be cancer. It could be um, losing a loved one. It could be getting fired from your job. It could be having family members who are rebelling, rebelling against you. It could be you got cheated on. Now, in, in David's case, he has so many b battles. He has so many different fights. We remember him fighting Goliath. We remember him fighting the Philistines. We remember him fighting uh, against Saul in some form or fashion or sparing Saul in some form or fashion. Like he couldn't even enjoy being king. Like he couldn't enjoy being king. And what's the point? We were told in life a lot of times, like, what's the point of having something or having a certain position or a certain status if you can't enjoy it? If you can't enjoy it. Now, King David lost something, though, that our Lord and Savior Jesus never, ever lost. And I want to look at Mark chapter 10, verse 45. And this is what made Jesus different. And this was once what King David was on. But he, when he got a little, to be a king, he, he lost this. It says, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So our Lord and Savior, the greatest of all, he came to serve. King David once was humble in his service, but we see that this switched up when he thought he was all of a sudden something. Now, we're going to look at Samuel chapter 11, 2 Samuel chapter 11. And it says this, it says, in the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem. And I empathize with him as well because me personally being in different leadership positions, that gets tiring. And you can't do everything. You actually do need to delegate. So in a way, I'm like, I'm giving David the benefit of the doubt. Like maybe he was just trying to delegate. and He wasn't being lazy. Verse two says one evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. Now, when you come from nothing and you go to something, you will hear you need to take moments to, to breathe. You need to take moments to enjoy it. And there is some truth to that. And I imagine David going on the roof of his palace and just looking at the beauty and looking at like, oh, look, look at look at this. Look at all of this awesome stuff that, that God ha has blessed me with. But. What I realize and what I see with this is David, just because David wasn't at war doesn't mean he wasn't in another war. And I'm going to break it down to you when I say this. It says from the roof, he saw a woman bathing. This was a different war. And we are in similar wars just like this. So you might not be at war physically with, with somebody trying to punch you or throw a spear at you or shoot you with a gun, but you in some war. In some form or fashion, it says the woman was very beautiful and David sent someone to find out about her. So already we're going to look at some battles that David has lost. One, he lost the battle of being where he was supposed to be. He was supposed to be leading his men. When you are the king, you got to serve. He probably was tired. Like, man, I didn't did all these wars. They need to go do this. But that was his role. That was the position that he was in. That was his service opportunity. So that's one battle that he has lost. The second battle that he's lost is when he sees this fine, fine. She had to be fine, fine, fine woman bathing. It catches his eye. And it's like, OK, some catch your eye. You don't got to stare. You can turn your head. He, he, he kept looking. He kept looking. That's another battle he lost. Then he lost another battle when he like, hey, you know what? Go, go see who that is. Go, go find out who that is. And this is what it says. The man said she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Iliam and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Now, why that is so unique to me is, is when he named like who daughter that is and whose wife that is. They had David had to have some relationship with these people. Obviously, he knew Uriah because Uriah is in his army. He, he knows something about Uriah. And then it talks about who her dad is. He has to, he knows who this is. And I look at the person telling him, like, did they tell him who this was because they wanted him to be like, hey, David, you know, this, you know, the family, you know, who daddy that is, you know, who kid that is. Right. Like, and did David miss the cue? But what David took that is he took that as, all right. Oh, that's the daughter of Eliam. Oh, the right. Right. The wife of Uriah, you know what? They not even here. I probably can get away with this. 
Look at what verse four says. It says, then David sent messengers to get her. He sent messengers to get her. And I felt sorry because it's like, why didn't somebody stop King David? Why didn't somebody tell him no? Or like, bro, you wrong, bro. You know, you know that somebody wife like, stop it. Stop it. You need to stop, David. But it's one of those things that people have a hard time telling, you know, or telling you you're wrong when they look at you and they depend on you. Or they look at you as the boss. They look up to you so much. They really, really have a hard time telling you no or that you're wrong. And the question that I have for you is, do you invite people to tell you that you're wrong? Do you invite people to tell you no? That's that's just some personal reflection right there. It goes on to say Bathsheba came to him and he slept with her. He had sex with her. They did the nasty. They did freaky deaky. Now she was purifying herself from her monthly uncleanness. Then she went back home. The woman conceived and sent word to David saying, I am pregnant. And I wonder, did Bathsheba say to herself, oh, we in trouble? Because she knew what Leviticus chapter 20, verse 10 says, which talks about a man committing adultery with another man's wife, another neighbor's wife. What would happen? What was the consequence supposed to be? Both of them put to death, the man and the woman. And it was going to be obvious that something took place because she's pregnant. And the math ain't going to be math. And when you're right, you get to doing the math. Like, hold up, I've been gone off at war and we ain't had sex in a long time. So whose baby is this? I wonder, did she panic? Now, I find it hard to think David thought it would go like this. And usually when we look at sin, we try to weigh the consequences. So David probably in his mind was like, all right, I'm going to have this woman come over. The worst thing that probably could happen is the sex is bad. Like King David just had a warped mindset on, on marriage, a warped mindset on sex. And you can tell that's because he has multiple wives when he only supposed to have one wife. So he already is like drunk with, with lust and he has no regard for that at all, at all. So when you listen to this, you have to be real. Like you have to be real about what sin you wish you could get away with or you're doing and you're saying like, this is okay. You, you have to be real with yourself because look at look at how it started for King Day. It started with something small with not being where he's supposed to be, then then looking and then going to find out some stuff. That's like us sliding in somebody DMs or going on Instagram, Facebook, and you're doing that stalking like the, it's the same thing. Because from a personal experience and knowing us humans, we think that we can see the consequences and like what it says. Like we can we can see what it's going to do and we can predict it and we can keep it right there. But sin has fine print that a lot of us don't read and sin doesn't stay where we put it now i'm gonna read the nlt version for this this part right here it says then david sent word to joab send me uriah the hittite so he realized like okay she pregnant i gotta figure out a plan i gotta go to plan b now okay so joab sent him to david when uriah arrived david asked him how joab and the army were getting along and how the war was progressing King David is he covering up that sin big time. Like, hey, how's the war going? Like, you know, I just want to check on your brother. Like, how you doing? How, how is everything going? Then he told Uriah, go on home and relax. David even sent him a gift to Uriah after he had left the palace. But Uriah didn't go home. He slept that night at the palace entrance with the king's palace guard. Like, this is just a stand up brother. Like I'm out to do, I want to do a whole episode on you, right? But this is just a stand up brother. He comes home. He has the opportunity to go do the nasty, get freaky deaky with his wife. He like, you know what? I can't do it. I'm going to sleep outside. I'm not, I'm not going to do it. Verse 10. When David heard that Uriah had not gone home, he summoned him and asked, what's the matter? Why didn't you go home last night after being away for so long? And let me just stop right there. When you get confused or when you get ticked at someone else being righteous, you know that at being something like going from something to nothing, you know, that has went to your head when you're looking at a person cross eyed for doing the right thing and being righteous. Look at how Uriah replies. He says the ark and the armies of Israel and Judah are living in tents and Joab and my Joab and my master's men are camping in the open fields. How could I go home to wine and dine and sleep with my wife? I swear that I would never do such a thing. Stand up, brother. Stand up, brother. Look at look at what David says, because now it's not now it's not working. It's like, come on, I'm trying to get you home. What is David trying to do? He's trying to make him go home, do the nasty so they can look like 
you got your wife pregnant so I can wash my hands clean because I don't want nothing else to do with this. Verse 12. This is David. He says, we'll stay here today and tomorrow you may return to the army. So Uriah stayed in Jerusalem that day and the next. Then David invited him to dinner and got him drunk. But even then he couldn't get get Uriah to go home to his wife. Again, he slept at the palace entrance with the king's palace guard. Like that's that's stand up, brother. He's like, I can't do it. Everybody out there fighting the war. I can't go home and get to wine and dine my wife and have sex and do all of this. Like that's a blessing. Like I, I need to be out there with the men. I, I have I have a duty. I have a commitment. He's thinking about his purpose. He's thinking about his Lord. Now we're going to go back to the NIV version. Verse 14. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it with Uriah. Now, this is pretty cold blooded because you got to think about this. What is this letter saying? Pretty cold blooded because Uriah was literally carrying his own death sentence. And it's also crazy to me that David knew that this brother was so upright, so righteous, so stand stand up in the right way that he wasn't going to read the letter. A lot of us would have been nosy. Like, let me see what the king talking about. What's his plan? But Uriah didn't do that. Verse 15 says in it. This is talking about the letter. David wrote, put Uriah out in front where the fighting is fiercest. Then withdraw from him so he will be struck down and die. So while Joab had the city under siege, he put Uriah at a place where he knew the strongest defenders were. When the men of the city came out and fought against Joab, some of the men in David's army fell. Moreover, Uriah the Hittite died. So King David's plan ended up working and King David has to be thinking like, how do you get away with murder? I did it. I, I, I did it. I'm good. I'm in the clear. And on this episode of how to get away with murder, when you start thinking that you're really something, when you start thinking that you're really something, you will think that you can get away with murder or you would think that you can get away with another sentence and you would downplay it like it's not that bad. Or, you know, I'm in this position. I, I can't lose this position. I, I have to do it this way. And, and what I noticed with this is when David considered himself nothing. And when David focused on God's love and God's grace, he spared Saul's life numerous times. Someone that most people have looked at him and said he should have killed. He's trying to kill you. You should kill him. But when David was considering himself nothing, he was humble. He was focused on God's love and God's grace. He spared this man's life who most people say actually deserved it. But now that David thinks he is something. He, he kills a man. Now that he's king, he's thinking that I can get away with murder. And on this episode of how to get away with murder, look at 2 Samuel chapter 12. That shows us you can't get away with something like this. Like there are going to be there are going to be consequences. So you can think you're getting away with something, but you know who always knows. God always knows. You can fool man for a little bit at least. Usually things come to the light, but you could not feel God. So it might be eating away with you, eating away at you in, in a certain way. And how did this come to light with David? God revealed this to the prophet. Uh, Nathan and he had Nathan go to David and he kind of played this like this story with him he's like yeah it was this dude who came he he has a whole bunch of cattle a whole bunch of lamb a whole bunch of everything but he took this one dude's lamb David like what you think about that and David's like what he did what greedy son of a gun you know what he should die he should have to pay back four times as much as he took and then Nathan like bruh I'm talking about you you took Uriah's wife and that's what what gets him and look at what it says. This is another consequence. This is verse 15. It says, after Nathan had gone home, the Lord struck that struck the child that Uriah's wife had born to David and he became ill. And we know that that child eventually died. We know that that child eventually died. Now, if you've been thinking like I'm going to teach you in this episode how to commit a murder, like an earthly murder, some crazy stuff like that, you're in the wrong place. But I know a lot of you knew that. OK, what's this title about? Where's the catch? And this is where we as followers of Christ, we can praise God for the murder that we actually did get away with. Well, I wouldn't say that we got away with it because we actually got caught. It's just that we had a God. We had a God who who paid a price for us. We had a God who paid a debt that we, we couldn't pay. So when you think about Jesus' death to those who spit on Jesus, to those who mocked him, to, mocked to those who struck him, to those who nailed him on the cross. We are just as guilty as those people. 
we are the reason that he, that he was murdered and he he gave himself up for murder. Look at what first Peter two verse 24 says. This is the amp version. It says he, Jesus personally carried our sins in his body on the cross, willingly offering himself on it as an as on an altar of sacrifice so that we might die to sin, becoming immune from the penalty and power of sin and live for righteousness. For by his wounds, you who believe have been healed. And on this episode of how we get away with murder, anything that we have done, rather it is murder or any type of mess, and we seem to get away with it, is because of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ allowed himself to be murdered for us. And as believers, we get it. It's all about what Jesus did. So we aren't paying the, the penalty of that, especially from um, a salvation standpoint. We we are not paying the penalty for that. It's going to be some earthly consequences, but we're not paying that, that eternity consequence when we believe in Jesus. So for us, it's about having a new focus, the new focus. So we're going to be murderers in some form or fashion. As believers, as followers, we need to murder our sinful flesh. We need to murder our ego. We don't need to flirt with sin. We need to confess our sins and, and our and our weaknesses and the thorns that we actually have. Um, the murder we should be attempting is the murdering of our, our sinful flesh. And when we do that and we murder our sinful flesh, we're putting ourselves in a different position. Because if you don't murder your sinful flesh, you are murdering and you're killing the relationship that you have with God. That drives a wedge in our relationship that we have with God. So I want to wrap this up and just think about like, okay, so how should we murder? We're talking about murdering our sinful flesh. How should we murder? The first thing is squashing those thoughts that we have. Don't flirt with it. Um, you, you don't want to have idle time. You, you want to replace that with something good. And I just want you to think about this. If, if David could have, what, what could have David have done when he saw Bathsheba bathing, looking all good and fine and the water glistening and hitting her body? Um, he could have go, he could have went and worked out. He could have went and wrote a song. We know dude could, was talented. He could have went and played some music for himself, not making any Trey songs hit, but making some music that glorifies the, the Lord. You know what? He could have even told his servants, hey, y'all need to go build a fence. Go build a fence so high so that I cannot see this anymore, ever, ever again. He could have done that. He, he was the king. He could have even been like, you know what? Let me come up with a strategy to help my men that are at war. Or he could have said, you know what? I need to go ahead and go to war because because idle time, this ain't it. I, I need to go because I'm a king and I'm a warrior. I need to go handle this business. So so squash those thoughts and then replacing it with something good. The second thing we can do is whatever sin, whatever sin that we wish most that we can get away with. Um, and, and I mean any sin, any sin in general, bring it to the altar, <laughs> bring it to the altar and confess it to God and also confess it to godly people so that they can help hold you accountable and, and be there for you and remind you of God's love and how you can be renewed and how to do things God's way. Uh, a third thing is set traps to kill bad behavior. So what I mean by that is like, all right, you got this problem. You need to put time limits on your phone. Um, you need to have an accountability partner. There are things that you need to put into place that will get you to be like, ooh, this ain't right. I need to stop. I need to absolutely stop. So setting traps to kill that bad behavior. And, and the last thing that you should do is focus on the sentence and the rap sheet that we should have. But we've been exonerated because of Jesus. Like that is such a beautiful thing. And that's something that we can continuously focus on. Like, man. The sentence that we deserve, the rap sheet that we really should have if we didn't, if we don't have Christ. What does that rap sheet look like? It looks horrible. It's filthy. It's all bad. But we've been exonerated. We've been declared not guilty. We've been redeemed because of what Jesus has done for us. And that's our new focus. Believe that. And this is the non-microwave truth. Thanks for joining me on this episode of How to Get Away with Murder. We continue in that series of From Nothing to Something. We got, got a couple more in store for you i think it's just one more episode one more episode up from this series in store for you and of course i want to keep that theme going to some songs that you can listen to that kind of tie in with this episode um song called soul ties soul ties by young c and another song is called alter and this got a couple different versions the main person is hovey but this can be hovey and forrest frank or it can be hovey and Sierra Alter. Check those songs out. I think they'll I think you'll like them. I think it'll bless you. I think it truly will bless you. If you like this episode, hit the five star, 
share it with a friend, leave a review. Peace, punch, Captain Crunch, and other drugs, and yes to Jesus. I am out.